figuring out how to spend the time you have and the resources you have is really hard. And so it's a little bit of a, hey, just keep trying. Just keep trying. Just do the best you can and keep trying. And that is the victory. I wanted to start with a very important question I've long had about an acting decision that you made, a character choice. Um, <laughs> why does Moe's run like that? You know, you're the second person in like three days to ask me this. Oh, yeah, no, I amazing. thought this was an original question. Well, the other people who asked me it were Jenna Fisher and Angela Martin from The Office. Okay. So, <laughs> so, uh, so Moe's was a character in The Office, if you're not familiar with the show, who was a, a sort of Mennonite or Amish adjacent gentleman who lived on a farm and was sort of a little bit of an odd duck. And the, I was basically a sight gag, right? That the writers were writing me into episodes in order to taunt me or haze me, your pick. So the, the, um, the very first episode that I was in, I, my, the stage direction was that I, I sort of like run into a room. And I was sort of, I'm not an actor. I don't know how to do it. I'm in awe of actors and their abilities to make choices and to inhabit characters. I'm not any of those things. So I was just like, what is this person? Who am I? And I just decided that he ran weirdly. So I don't know why, but I held my I held my arms out and held my hands straight out and just ran just in a in the weirdest way I could think. I was just right. like, I don't know if this is right or wrong. I'm just gonna make a choice. And I did it. And then and then because everybody enjoyed it so much in the writer's room, they made me do it in ten thousand other episodes. And so now I was like, well, I now I'm pot committed. I have to run this way every time they want me to run because this is the way this character runs. So very little, um, you know, I don't know what you would say. It's not that no thought went into it. It's just that it wasn't carefully considered as a as a choice. Well, when I chase my children around, that's how I run just to bother them, and it, it seems to make them deeply uncomfortable and makes the whole thing a lot more fun. Great. I'm glad I'm glad that it could help someone in some way, shape or form. <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, I've, I'm so glad to get the book and I, I loved it. I, I read the galley of it. I thought it was fascinating. I'm going to I'm going to go another obscure question. One of my favorite parts of the whole book is your little footnote on Ayn Rand, um, mm. where you talk about it, it possibly being a war crime to assign <laughs> one's staffers to read Ayn Rand. But, <laughs> but it brought up an interesting, I think. Uh, I, I've I've also read Ayn Rand. Uh, I think she's fascinating when you're 19 years old, and if you don't grow out of it, there's probably something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. um, which is, of course, a, a slightly unfair characterization. But if you think about what she was trying to do, it's from an artistic standpoint, it's pretty amazing that she writes this long ass book that is basically propaganda for a philosophy or a viewpoint that it it works. Like it's yeah. not the most beautiful work of art, but like millions of people have read it. Like it's it's actually readable and people read it. It strikes me as you would have a unique appreciation for how impossible that task is doing it essentially on The Good Place and then with this book to write about philosophy or big ideas and have them be entertaining and accessible is really, really hard. Yeah, I mean, she's arguably the most successful philosopher of the last... I don't know, 150 years or something. I mean, I don't even know who's comparable. So it is a, it's a neat trick she pulled because she, she buried, like you say, she buried her philosophy in novels and, and people I think are generally speaking more apt to engage with philosophy through a, a different artistic medium than a, than an intimidating uh, philosophy book. Uh, and it, so she did a really good job. Like she was, she's a very effective spokesperson for her own ideas, and she and she laid them out in an in a way that was intended to be more entertainment. I don't find her books entertaining. I find her books soporific and miserable to read. I, they, they, you don't like um, forty page speeches? <laughs> yeah, I mean the other problem is, of course, it's like you know, and one of her longest books is about the locomotive industry, which is like that <laughs> not a thing that you can really engage with in 2022 or whatever. But um, I, I think that there is a lesson there and, and it's part of the reason I wanted to write this book, uh, How to Be Perfect, which is I think that philosophers have so many things to offer us and so much wisdom and so many ideas and just suggestions and and um, I don't know, uh, just uh, they have philosophies. And yet they wrote 
such intimidating and dull at times uh, works that nobody, the barrier to entry is so high. You know, I remember thinking when I was doing research for The Good Place, it's like, man, like these are such good ideas and they're so hard to dig out. It's like, it's, it's like someone had written a recipe for a chocolate chip cookie that was delicious and also somehow healthy but the recipe was 700 pages long and written in German. And it was like, well, no one's going to read it if it's 700 pages long and written in German. And so if you could just communicate these ideas in a different way, I think it's what you've tried to do with your books and your podcasts is say like, there is wisdom here. I know it's ancient. I know it's scary. It's, it's Greek and Assyrian and Roman and it's scary, but, but the wisdom is real and helpful potentially to people. And so if you can just communicate it in a better way, um, it it will improve the world. That's the bet we're all making, I think. It is weird, though, because, I mean, you talk about uh, a lot of ancient philosophers and then sort of mi- the, the philosophers right in between as well, like Kant and, and, and so on. But it is kind of weird that like when you go back and you read the ancients, in some ways, they're actually a lot more accessible than the people who came a thousand years later and way more accessible than the people who are 50 years ago or right now it's it's oh, by why far is that? by far i mean part of it i think is that a lot of a lot of ancient greek philosophy specifically uh and a lot of pre-socratic greek philosophy is very epigrammatic right it's like yes. everything is like a sentence um i think that's part of why nietzsche was popular because nietzsche wrote sort of epigrammatically like his works are often um for well, first of all they're very entertaining but they're often just like bullet points um, you know, little bits of wisdom that he had an incredible facility with, uh, with communicating very short, very swiftly. There's a, there's a thing in one of his books, I think it's beyond good and evil, where he talks about how he describes humans as looking at the world through frog's eyes. And it's like a frog. And what he meant was a frog that pops its head out of a, out of a, a, a lake and can only see the world from this very low vantage point. So it doesn't understand anything that's happening in the big picture, like that's so evocative, that's so cool and like understandable. And so I think a lot of the ancient Greeks uh, had that same instinct, which was we got to boil this down. Like this is like one sentence at a time. And I think that really helps with the, the way they communicate. Back in the ancient world, philosophy wasn't abstract. It wasn't theoretical. It was designed to help you live the best life. In Stoicism 101, we have a two-week course that will introduce you into philosophy that will make you a better person. There's interviews with me, daily lessons that will challenge you to be better, give you new ways of thinking, tackling the problems of life, becoming your best self. As Marx really says, you could be good today, but instead you choose tomorrow. Epictetus says, how much longer are you going to wait to demand the best for yourself? Check out our new course, Stoicism 101 at dailystoic.com slash 101. Yeah, you think about uh, like a metaphor like Plato's cave or the, an allegory like Plato's cave. And you're just like, man, that holds up like super well. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And then you read some contemporary philosophy and it's this this endless web of of discursive, you know, like people trying to get at um get at ideas by summarizing 10,000 other ideas and then formulating their theory out of those ideas. And granted it's like it's a little bit like I don't know if you're watching that Beatles documentary Get Back that's on um Disney Plus now but like there I think I have two thoughts when I when I watch that Beatles documentary. One is um god these they were just so good. They were just such great songwriters. And then the second thought which is linked is like also, no one else had been writing songs yet. So yes. <laughs> like they they had the advantage of getting there first in a lot of these ways. And also they were geniuses. And I think that probably applies to philosophy too, right? There's probably a little bit of like, we're the first people who are putting down these thoughts or trying to understand the world in this way. And so they could be a little more precise and basic in their approach as opposed to now, where if you're a philosophy professor, you have to sift through thousands of years of stuff and summarize it and, and, and analyze it in order to get out whatever you're trying to get out. Well, it's kind of like the Simpsons did it thing. It's like they did it for so long, right. so early that they took all the low hanging fruit and a lot of the, the high fruit, but they took all the uh, uh, Aristotle's like, uh, yeah, it's, it's all wide open space and he's just right. claiming all of it. When I used to write it Saturday night live and this, uh, and this is, this is 20, almost 25 years ago now, but you would come up with an idea for a sketch 
and you'd be like, oh, this is good. This is going to be really good. And then you'd be like, oh, this has been done, but Jack Handy did this already or, or Jim Downey did this already. And eventually what you have to do, and maybe there's an analogy here for philosophers is you have to say like, okay, this is not a new idea because this idea has already been explored. But if you only like engage with brand new ideas, you're never going to write anything. And so you just have to say like, I'm going to put my spin on it or my take on it or my execution of it will be different. And that, and that will be the reason it's worth engaging with and exploring and instead of just like, I can only write something if no one has ever written it before. I think that's right. Although I would argue that like, if you take like Plato and these sort of analogies or, or sort of thought experiments that he comes up with, the fundamental difference between what he's doing and what it seems like a lot of philosophers have tried to do in the more modern era is like, it feels like he's trying to get to clarity and they're trying to get to like, let me blow your mind with this. So like the, the allegory of the cave is this thing, but it basically says like, look, you have an obligation to go back and try to help people once you experience truth. I feel like the trolley problem, which you talk a lot about in the book, it's sort of like, yeah, you're like fucked either way. There's just nothing you can do about it. Or, or like, how do we know we're not living in a computer simulation? That's an interesting philosophical question but what am I supposed to do with this information? So it, it almost feels like the ancients were trying to like get you clarity about the meaning of life or what you're supposed to do as a human being in a complex world. And it feels like a lot of philosophy today is like, let me just muddy the waters so much that you're just like, I don't know. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that there is a, um, there is a here's what matters thing that the ancients were doing, right? What matters? Okay, well, here are the here are the things that matters to the Stoics. Here are the things that matter to Socrates or whoever. And now, like the trolley problem is a perfect example because like you say, baked into the equation is someone dies, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're just screwed because someone is going to die and you are going to be the one who is standing at the front of the trolley making the decision. And and it's it's fascinating because someone is going to die. So the stakes of it in the in the writing world, we would say the stakes of this problem are enormous. It's life or death. And so that is a good way to tease out the differences in moral decision making when you know that in the best case scenario, one person's going to be smushed by a trolley like, all right, let's let's ride. Let's figure this out. So there's a there's obviously a fundamental difference between trying to lay out for people here is what matters in life. And then much later laying out for people, here are the terrible decisions the terrible choices that we have to make on a day-to-day -day basis. How do we make the best ones we can? That's like a huge difference. And I wonder if part of that is the ancient philosophers actually did stuff, right? Like they, they were thinking about this philosophically, but then they had jobs. Like, you know, even Socrates is like, is in the army, right? And and then is, you know, sort of faced with this life or death trial at the end of his life, contrasted with, I think, the more academic philosopher whose job is just to think about complex things. So like you talk about this guy in one of the footnotes who's looking at the trolley problem, I think, and he's basically like, no, you can't kill anyone for any reason because they all value their lives whatever. And, and it's like, that is interesting, but I guarantee you like middle of the pandemic, if you were like, Hey, should we give the shots to older people first or younger people? That guy would then have an answer. Right. But it's like sort of academically, you can come up with a reason why the, the question is infinitely complex or can be reduced down to this black and white thing. But if you're actually a politician or a teacher, or you're, a, you're creating a show and you have to make character decisions, like you have to cut through all the abstractions and just like get to real life. Yes. And it's a key aspect of a successful philosophy to me that it has practical application. I don't much, I don't care that much about theory because I, the goal of this book and the goal of like my own goal for myself and engaging with this stuff is like, what can I practically do on a day-to-day -day basis when I'm forced with all these decisions? So the guy you're talking about is this philosopher named John Torek who wrote a piece called uh, Do the Numbers Matter? And what he essentially says is that, like you said, everyone's life is maximally valuable to him or herself, which means if you are, the, I think that at one point in his paper, there's a thing where you're, you're, the, you're the captain of a boat and you're off the uh, coast of an island and in the middle of the island is a volcano. And at the north end is one person, at the south end is like 50 people. And the volcano erupts and everyone's going to die. And you have to choose, do I go to the north end 
to save one person or the South End to save 50 people. And his thing is you flip a coin because you cannot, the sum total of people's lives does not matter. What matters is that each person's life is maximally valuable to him or herself. So you can't just, you can't just add them together, right? So where that takes him, if you extrapolate, is one person needs a million doses of a life-saving medicine to save him from a disease, and a million people need only one dose of that medicine. You're still supposed to flip a coin? Like, that's not a practical decision. Like, right. put John Torek in that decision and see what he does. And I don't think he's going to say, yeah, let's flip a coin and let a million people potentially die. So uh, what well, that I'm- goes to Kant, right? Would you want to live in a world where everyone acted that way? Of course not. You, <laughs> where the world would was cease to ex- <laughs> the, the world would cease to exist almost immediately because uh, no one would ever make any uh, decision that maximizes for outcome, and we'd all go to war and die like very quickly. Right, and and also you know you're 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 if there's any practical version of that situation. It's some kind of decision like the trolley problem where you look at where you are and you say, all right, I've got two choices and they both kind of suck. And so I'm going to go with the one that I think is better knowing that I'm still causing harm. And the philosophies I'm most interested in are the ones that say, here are all the tools you can use to analyze the decision and to say like, yes, this is going to be a, this is a 55, 45 situation. It's not black and white. It's not up or down. But here are all the tools you can make to make sure that you get the best understanding of the of what the fifty five percent is, you know. Yeah, and to me, that's where where Rand fails particularly bad. Is it's like, so the idea is like because successful, brilliant people aren't appreciated enough by society, they're just going to take their ball and go home. Like it's just <laughs> preposterous. Like like I just it's so childish and so ab- absurd that like. It's almost you get to the end of the book and you're like, is this really your argument? Are you 11? What are you talking about? <laughs> yes. And that's the reason why, as you said, it's a thing a lot of people engage with and, and admire in like high school when the world of ideas is opening up and the kind of you're 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 feeling like a like you're a kid playing dress up as an yes. adult. Right. You're feeling very. I remember when I was in high school, um, my dad was a philosophy major in college and he had all his old philosophy books lying around and I started reading them and I didn't understand them. But I loved the idea of being a high school kid who read philosophy. So I would sure. walk around with Nietzsche or or Heidegger or something in my bag and like, or Kierkegaard and I, would, you know, I had being and nothingness and I would like leaf through it. And I didn't understand a word I was saying or reading, but I loved the idea of being the kind of person who did that. And I think that's a lot of what Ayn Rand appeals to is like, this is a big idea. I'm filling your head with big ideas and you get so swelled up with pride because you understand them and they and they're like, "Yes, of course, I am powerful. I am I can do this. I'm I'm on my own. I am an adult now." And then when you are 23 and you read it again, hopefully you say like, "Well, this is absurd. Like <laughs> the world can't function this way. This is ridiculous." So, yeah, I again, it's it's a little distressing like I say in my book, it's a little distressing that she is the most successful idea relator of the last hundred years, but I don't think it's really in dispute. Yeah, no, it's like, it makes sense if you have as arrested a worldview as Dwight Schrute, but like if you're an, <laughs> a functioning adult in society, like the holes are so obvious that you, what do you do? Yeah, exactly. Yes. There is, there is a certain kind of person who still has a, a an admiration for that, for her philosophy. And that kind of person is a person who, in my opinion, just isn't thinking enough about other people or about the world or about society or about the town they live in, or just the concept of like otherness is just lost on people who are fans of her work. Well, it's funny because the book is called How to Be Perfect, but I think actually the central question of the book is what you just said. It's really like, what do we owe each other? That's really, to me, the central thrust of the book, but also of most philosophy is just like, what are what are our obligations to the right thing, to mm-hmm. uh, other people, to justice? Like, what are we actually allowed to do versus shouldn't do versus uh, could get away with, but aren't going to do anyway. Yeah, that's the goal, right? Is to find, I think of it as the ceiling and the floor, right? There's a, there's a floor for how little we are allowed to help other people or to care about other people or other 
groups of people near us, around us, here, uh, as Peter Singer would say, either here or over there, how, what's the, what's the minimum in any situation that you're required morally to care? And then there's also a ceiling. There's like a, there's a, there's a, a danger in only caring about other people over there or nearby or whatever, because then you're not living a sort of full and verdant life yourself. You're not flourishing yourself as Aristotle would say. And so the goal is to find the range and to just stay within that range, right? It's like, if, if you do things where you're like, man, this is a really selfish act and I have, I am, I am uh, denying my responsibility to other people or denying what I owe to other people, that's bad. And if you get so lost in the concept of only caring about morality, then as Susan Wolf would say, you're not like, you know, pra- reading books yourself or practicing the, your tennis game or cooking or spending time with your family. And then you're not really a person. So it's, it's, There is a range somewhere in the middle there. And our goal is to find that range and really try to nail it. That's what I'm I'm writing about now. I'm doing this book on temperance uh, because I'm doing a series on the four cardinal virtues. And I found it to be a very difficult book to write about because it's such an unsexy topic. Like to say like, (laughs) no, like you can't do it. Or to say like, yes, do it, chase as much of it as you can. That's very simple. But the idea is like some, but not too much is like mm-hmm. the perfect amount of unsexiness that it's hard to talk about, hard to get people excited about, and also hard to define. It's a moving target. It's an absolutely moving target, as all the virtues are, right? The mean of every virtue is a moving target. And one of my favorite things about Aristotle specifically is that he says to you, okay, here's the deal. There is a mean and there's a perfect amount of every virtue that you need to attain and you know courage or temperance or mildness or whatever it is there's a perfect amount and if you go too high that's bad and if you go too low that's bad and our goal is to spend our entire lives every waking minute of our lives finding chasing and finding that perfect amount and then he says what is that perfect amount nobody really knows (laughs) (laughs) so like so he's uh, and there's something kind of beautiful about it to me because he's basically saying all of life is trial and error right? Everything about your life is you make a choice, you see the results, you analyze how it went wrong, you maybe adjust, you make another choice, and you and you just get closer and closer and closer, asymptotically closer to these means. And the fact that he kind of can't really actually tell you, because nobody can, what that mean is, it's just very human to me. Like, it really feels very human and very... Um, kind of uh lovely in its in its in its it's essentially a flawed philosophy because there's he can't Kant can tell you like here's what you do right do this if you do this you win and utilitarians can do that too they can say like more good than bad if you do more good than bad you win the ethics contest but aristotle is kind of saying like all of the human existence is trial and error and I'm telling you, you'll ne- you're essentially never going to get there because I don't even know where there is. And that's, I, I don't know, there's something kind of beautiful about that to me. I, to me, I actually think it makes it more perfect be, or, or more of a usable philosophy because it's like, welcome, welcome to reality. It's complicated, right? Like, <laughs> right. I feel like Zen Buddhism does this well where they're like, sometimes do this, sometimes do the opposite of this. You'll know when, you know, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. like, because if you, tr- if you actually think you can be like, here is the rule or law, follow this in your behavior always you lose the ability to actually function in the real world and where things are complicated or confusing or you have imperfect amounts of information. Like I love the way the Stoics cut through this is they're like, okay, nothing that's not in our control is good or bad, right? Um, so we're we're indifferent. But then Seneca goes, but aren't there such thing as indifference you would prefer, right? So he's like, he's like <laughs> obviously if you're tall or short, you know, you'll be fine either way, but it is better to be tall, right? Like if you, or it's like, if I, if you had to choose between being rich or poor, not that either one of those says anything about you as a person, it's obviously better to have more than less. And so I just like, it's like cheating, but it also makes perfect sense that like, yeah, like too much money is obviously a problem. Not enough money is a problem. Split the difference. Some amount of money is good, but on 
generally you'd rather have more than less. Like that's just life. <laughs> yeah, I know. And that, and I also can't help but think about the differences in the, in the life that Zeno or Seneca was leading and the life that we're leading now. Right. Because the difference between when you say like some amount of money is right. Well, that is an enormous range, right? Some right. amount of money is $35,000 a year versus $780,000 a year. The lives being led by those two people are enormously different in a number of ways, not just in what they have or what they can do, but the daily stresses that they're under because of the amount of money they have. And so sometimes those philosophies do a little bit break down when the, when you're talking about a sort of generalized, hey, you, you'll just feel it out. You know, if you, you'll, you'll kind of know one way or the other, like, how will you know whether you should trade a job that where you're making $412,000 a year for one where you have to move to a different city to make $468,000 a year? Like that's eh, like if, if, if it's just it. And that's why I think I admire the rough edges of something like virtue ethics. It's because even 2,400 years ago, there's an acknowledgement, I think, or there's a tacit acknowledgement that this is really hard. It's yeah. just hard. These decisions are hard. Life is hard. Figuring out how to exist as a, as a, as a citizen, as a, as a wife or husband or mother or father or son or daughter uh, and and being a, and an employee and a student and a traveler and a, and an enthusiast and a number of different hobbies like figuring out how to spend the time you have and the resources you have is really hard and so it's a little bit of a hey just keep trying just keep yeah. trying just do the best you can and keep trying and that is the victory. Well, I think the money one is interesting too because it's like what if you're just really good at what you do and therefore and you happen to be randomly in a very high paid profession, should one stop doing that because money is not a good, right? right? Like, should should one give it all away? Uh, should one run in the opposite direction? It's, it's a, and I think, again, the Stoics are fascinating because like, they, like, there is something about being the Socrates or the Diogenes, the cynics or the Zen monk that sort of like, I renounce all of this and I'm go, you know, I, I, I am interested, like, even Kierkegaard is this like, weird, asocial person who's not able to function in the world, right. right? He's like your delicate flower artist type who's brilliant, but like, you know, the newspapers write something mean about him and he's like, destroy <laughs> I, I, I like that. I like the philosophers that were like, you know, just like in the mix of life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. And that's, that's what I sort of what I mean by practicality. It's like, I, I trust the people more who were living a life of engagement, of civic engagement and societal engagement, than the sort of like, I'm going to go off into a little corner and just imagine use. That's why Kant doesn't appeal to me personally. Kant's thing is like a, a situation arises and he is sort of asking you to like press pause on the world, go into like a solitary confinement chamber discern a rule using only your own brain and your ability to reason, come up with a maxim that then follows that universalizable rule, and then go back, hit play on life, and then say, I am choosing to do X, Y, and Z. And it, it's just like, all right, man, like, yeah, in, in, in theory, that's, that's great. Um, because you, if you have, if you have a, a clicker that you, where you can pause everything all the time and, and, spend the resources to really figure out, tease out what the right maxim is, great. Most of us don't have that ability. In fact, no one really has that ability. So instead, it's a little bit like, you know, Aristotle says like, all right, try get angry, but not so angry. You know, yes. don't get too angry. Just get this, uh, get the right amount of angry at the right people for the right reasons, and then you'll be okay. And sort of by extension, he then says like, afterwards, think about what you did. Think about the choice you made. Did you get too angry? Did you not get angry enough? Next time, modulate and get and try to get closer to whatever that right amount of anger is. And it's, you know, Kant is offering you this um, this foolproof guide, right? He's offering you a like, these are the notes for the test you're going to take. And if you study the notes and you memorize everything I'm telling you to memorize, you'll get an A on the test. You'll nail every question. But the actual test is 
your entire life and it involves a lot of other people who are who have other demands and other issues going on and there isn't always in fact there very frequently is not ever the opportunity to really spend the time thinking about stuff that he wants you to spend well that that is an interesting other part of the book which is i think you talk about it pretty early on we're like you know we hem and haw about these things we're not sure what's the right amount should i do this should i do that and then you're like but some people don't think about this at all <laughs> right. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. I it's that that's one of the biggest problems I think in the world is that like you you can spend as much time as you want mulling these decisions and choices and coming up with different theories of how to behave based on different great writers and philosophers and everything else and then you'll encounter mostly people who just don't care in the slightest bit about what happens. And the newspapers are full of people, very powerful people in every realm of society who either don't care at all or have read and thought about this stuff and have decided to actively fight it and, yeah. like, and, and thwart it at every opportunity. And then, so it's like, well, what do you do? And this is actually the stoic. This is where it comes back to the stoic idea, I think. It's like, well, you can't control them, right? Sure. You can't control that. You control what you do. And it's, a, it's very like, the, the thing I like about the stoics is it's, it's almost like the way I talk to my kids. It's like, don't worry about him. Don't worry about this thing you can't control. You you prepare. You do what you need to do, and then one way or the other, you'll know that you did your best. That is a that's a very um, simple parental child uh, bit of wisdom that is also a, a sort of stoic bit of wisdom. I think. I think where we struggle with it though is that it feels so unfair. You know, you're like, <laughs> but they they're getting away with this, and yeah. you're telling me I have to pass up on this or I have to delay gratification or I have to willingly, uh, you know, I have to willingly comply even though no one would actually force me to. I think we struggle with the society with the idea that like, it's all voluntary at the end of the day. They're, like, I think this is largely where the idea of God comes from. It's like, well, God's going to make you do it, right? Or you'll right. be punished at the end of your life. You just have to trust me, but there will be justice or karma for you at the end. That's yeah. how I think how we tell ourselves that they're not really getting away with it. And by the way, not just punished, but rewarded for yes. the people who do the good thing, right? It's like yeah. that it is it is a a thing that people on earth, human beings invented in order to answer the question of why is everything so unfair? <laughs> and it's like, well, don't worry, at the end there will be a reckoning, right? And and so there, that is a uh, that's a tough thing to hold on to, especially if you're not a religious person. I'm not particularly religious. I wasn't raised in any religious tradition, and so I've never had the feeling, personally, that my life will be either rewarded or punished in the afterlife, which is odd because I made a whole TV show about it. <laughs> but but that um, that feeling, I can a hundred percent understand the comfort in it because it is incredibly unfair what happens in the world. You see people all the time, again, in positions of power, whether in politics or business or anything else, who are doing outrageously immoral things on a daily basis and are never punished for it, ever. They never, there is no comeuppance, there's no justice, there's no retribution at all. People, one thing I've been thinking about recently, and I know this is a topic of, of some political discourse right now, is why does any American politician allowed to own any stock in any single U.S. company ever? It, it is absolutely absurd to think that the people that we elect to represent us have specific personal financial stake in specific companies because the government spends trillions of dollars a year and that money can so easily be misappropriated and allocated to companies that enrich them. And they're supposed to be protecting us, not the other way around. And, there, and yet you see all the time senators and representatives who steer our money, my money and your money toward companies that they profit from. That's an obvious ethical lapse at the highest level. And those people are never punished. And so when you are, when you're faced in a, on a daily basis with uh, stories and images of people benefiting from a lack of caring about ethics, not just like they don't care, but they, the fact that they don't care is better for them. They yes. are winning the race. It's an adaptive are, advantage. 
Yes, exactly. They are. They have figured it out and they are winning the race. And you know that nothing bad will ever happen to them. It becomes very hard, even harder to care about being ethical yourself. And it, that's why it's like, you just got to put your nose to the grindstone and double down and, and just know that s- f- somehow or other, it is better to ha- to care than to not care. I mean, the, the Christian argument is like, yeah, you'll be rewarded in heaven or punished in hell. I think I've always said that the stoic argument is um, whether or not those things exist, you will live in hell now or you will <laughs> live in you, you know, like your life will be hell. If you like mm-hmm. it's not sin because God will be angry, sin because it will punish you. I think that's I mean, obviously, that's why I, I believe it's why I try to tell myself. And then, yeah, you watch, I don't know, Michael Scott or you watch Donald Trump. And the, the question is like, are is it fun to be them? Like, are they getting away with it? Right. It's I'm not it's it. Sometimes it feels like it's the answer is obvious. And then sometimes you're not so sure. Yeah. I mean, we this is a very frequent writer's room debate. I'll tell you in Hollywood. <laughs> A writer's room debate is, would it better, th- this was a question that was posed to our to a writer's room six, seven years ago. Would you rather be who you are or Rob Gronkowski of the then New England Patriots and now Tampa Bay Buccaneers? So sure. Rob Gronkowski, if you don't know, is a six foot, six inch tall, just happy go lucky. He's a, basically a golden retriever that like a bolt of lightning hit him and he turned into a football player. Yes. He's just a rambunctious kind of ding dong who just runs around and chugs beers and plays football and he's really rich and he's a he's a total uh idiot and in the in the best possible way in the michael scott sense of the word yeah like lovable idiot just an absolute ding dong and and everyone uh, everyone was like oh i'd rather be me like that guy is i mean first of all forget about the injuries sustained playing football whatever but like it's unclear whether he can string three sentences together without uh, getting a headache right but then a lot of people are like, no, it's better to be Rob Gronkowski. It just is like he because what he is not tortured by anything. He does not appear to be um, uh, conflicted or tortured or upset by the world. And the the process of engaging with the world and of caring about the world means you are bound to be on a daily basis upset by it. You're all of the injustice and all of the problems and. And the and the seeming lack of interest on the beha- on behalf of all the Rob Gronkowski's in like fixing anything means that you suffer a kind of pain that is outside of your control that there's nothing you can do about. And I I mean the, I I chose to be myself and not imagine myself as Rob Gronkowski. But I by the end of the argument I was firmly I firmly understood the argument that it is better to be Rob Gronkowski. Yeah, it's like nature is very merciful in this in the same way that like if you if your arm got bitten off by a shark, your body would go in this, you know, insane state of shock. So you would feel nothing. Uh, but when you get a paper cut, you don't get it. It's like when you are stupid or selfish or awful, you nature, it's like, well, I'm also going to pluck away the self-awareness that would make you ha- like it. Like uh, there's that that scene in the office where Daryl says, you know, like you're the bravest one in the office because you you wake up every day and you're Michael Scott. But, <laughs> but the reality is, it actually d- probably doesn't require any bravery because he can't conceive of being anything other than himself. So by lacking the self awareness, you know, he probably never gets the shame or the self consciousness. Well, that's a really interesting point to make specifically in light of that show, because the premise of that show is that an unobserved group of people is suddenly observed by a camera crew. And we used to talk all the time in the writer's room there about when when the characters looked to the camera and why, right? So very frequently on that show, if you've seen it, um, something would happen and then one of the characters would glance at the camera And they all had different relationships with the camera. Like Jim would look to the camera like he was saying, uh, you're my friend and you, you, you and I are on the same page. You see how, how ridiculous this place is. Right. And Dwight would look to the camera like, yes, I'm awesome. And I just did something really awesome. But Michael would often look to the camera like, "Uh Oh, I just said something embarrassing or dumb or racist or whatever. And I just remembered, Oh my God, there's someone looking at me. And then he would quickly try to backtrack or or undo whatever he had done. And 
it's an interesting psychological experiment to say like, well, what happens when a person who is selfish or uh, obnoxious or whatever, put a, what if we put cameras on all those people? <laughs> and that's in a weird way, that is what's happening in our world, right? It's like that sure. now there's a camera on everybody all the time. The question is, do, do you, if you played back for people, their, some of their behavior and some of their um, decisions, would it matter? And obviously, I think in some cases, as we've seen in the last couple of years, like people go into a, a Taco Bell and they're not wearing a mask and someone politely asks them to put on a mask and they lose their minds and they scream and yell and they stomp their feet and they break things and they talk about uh, Nazis. And I don't think that those people, if you played the video of them doing that, that someone took on their iPhone, would go like, oh boy, I, I really, I don't think they would have an Aristotelian, I think I got too yeah. angry there. I don't think yeah. that would occur to them. But I think there probably are some people who aren't totally aware of what they look like or sound like when they make decisions like that. And it's a kind of interesting thing to think about. If you could make a documentary about every living human being, like how many of us would change our behavior? I think a lot of us probably would. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, it, it does feel like I, I you you talk about that briefly in the book, and it is, I think, the part that's been most baffling to me uh, in in the pandemic. Like, it really hit me rereading Marcus Aurelius, uh, realizing like, oh wait, he wrote this during a plague that he probably <laughs> died of, right? Um, that, that killed like millions of people. But he he talks about how there's two kinds of plagues. There's the one that takes your life, and the one that affects your character. And it does feel like watching a lot of people who were filmed or or unsolicitedly put these things on the internet themselves, people really do struggle with what you call like the bare minimum, doing like even the most bare yep. minimum for other people. And they have like, is that just like, they're like, oh, I never thought about it and I'm not going to think about it. It's almost like they really have thought about it. They're like, here's why I should not be inconvenienced even in the slightest way to help other people because like I was talking to someone I was like there who's very Christian I'm like look love thy neighbor right like it's the most basic premise of Christian thought and you're just like well I'm healthy why should I get vaccinated or wear a mask and it's like they, like I was trying to walk them through that contradiction and they were just like yeah but I don't I don't need it like they just kept right. saying this over and over again like they could I just couldn't get them to compute that they had an obligation to another person right and you see that with whenever anyone with that attitude tries to draw an analogy, it's always the most revealing thing because it's like, hey, you know, a hundred thousand people die in car crashes every year. Why that we still we still wear, uh, you know, we still l let people drive. And it's like, well, yeah, car crashes aren't contagious. I don't know what to tell you. Like you getting into a car crash doesn't then potentially cause me. Uh, halfway around the world to get into a car crash or it's like but, but also well, speeding is illegal uh driving while drunk is illegal all the ways <laughs> yeah. that it could unnecessary you know hitting a pedestrians have the right of way all, there are there are like so many laws that limit what you're right. allowed to do to so there's not negative externality and also like even though you know we, we also still require you to wear a seatbelt. we still <laughs> right. make it safe as, as safe as it can lauren bobert who's a congresswoman from colorado just tweeted out a thing the other day that was like this many people die from cancer every year. And it's like, right. again, if you get cancer, it doesn't cause potentially me to get cancer if you and I eat in a restaurant together. And it, but like those arguments are always thrown back at them immediately. And never once has any one of them gone like, oh, good point. Like that's yeah. the thing that the thing that the internet age has has gotten rid of most effectively is the sentence, oh, that's a good point. Like you just <laughs> never ever. Oops. Oops, sorry. Yeah, I I revise my opinion like that. That you just never see people take put put an idea into the world with that level of stridency, receive new information, or or have an argument come back at them that they maybe hadn't considered, and then say like, you know what, you're totally right, and I I rescind my comment. Like that's if we could get better at that as a society, that would go a long way toward I think curing a lot of what ails us. No, I think that's right. And it's like, if there's a thought experiment, so it's like, yeah, let's say 300,000 people die a year uh, of, of cancer. And like everyone had, but if everyone wore glasses, it would cut that number by 25% or 10% right. so 30,000 people. Well, wearing glasses is not fun. It's not cheap. Most of us don't need glasses, but if right. somehow everyone wearing glasses even when it was dark outside, even when they 
fogged up in the in the steam or whatever that 30,000 people would would survive. I mean like most people if it in not in a politicized environment would be like easy, let's do that right now. But yep. for whatever reason in the pandemic and I think this is what Marcus was saying about something that infects your character, we've we've decided like no, this is different. I specifically don't give a shit about this <laughs> thing or who it affects. My friend, Megan Amram, who's a writer I've worked with a lot, said the smartest thing about COVID, which is basically it's a, it's a black light. It's a thing that was turned on and revealed all of these ugly stains that are all over the country and the world, really. And that's the biggest one to me, is that what it really revealed was this bubbling sense of, I don't care. Like, yeah. I, like you, you're in trouble. I don't care. The the woman, the old woman next to me who lives next to me might die if I don't do this. I don't care. And the the analogy that I draw in the book is like, you know, you you're going to like a strip mall, to, uh, there's pharmacy to pick up a prescription, and you park, and it's really hot outside, and it's annoying, and the crosswalk is a block away, and so you look both ways. You're an adult. We're all adults here. I can jaywalk now. Technically, yes, it's a crime. But it's the most, arguably the most minor crime, right? And so you just jog across the street and you pick up your prescription and it's fine. If I told you that, hey, instead of jaywalking, if you just walk a block south, use the crosswalk and then walk a block north to get your prescription, 750,000 people might not die. I don't know why, but that's the case. We could save three quarters of a million people if we all agree to just go even, I know it's a hot day. I know you're late. I know that this is a you just want to jog across the street, but if you just do this slightly inconvenient thing, we could save three quarters of a million people. To say no to that is just the most callous and awful decision. And I and that and yet wearing a mask is roughly speaking to me as inconvenient as walking a block south and then a block north to the CVS. So it's but then just you so add disheartening. on top of that. The weirdest part is you add on top of that. It's it's not like you're like, ah, eh, but if no one's looking, I'm still gonna I'm still gonna uh, sneak across the street because like not everyone has to do it, right? If you're like ten <laughs> percent can still get away, you still but then then so you're like, okay, maybe I get that. Uh, but then you're like, no, no, no. My position is not only am I gonna do that. I'm then going to actively try to convince as many people as possible to also do it with me right. because because I not only don't care, I just want to watch the world burn. Yeah, you're going to I'm going to call the people who decide to go use the crosswalk Nazis and fascists and, and I'm going to decide that they're the real problem here. Yeah, that is it's truly um it's truly disheartening. I I really I find it uh to be the most disheartening part of this, to, to have it revealed through this pandemic, the percentage of people in America and in the world who, who not only don't care, but actively want to do the opposite of what a caring person would do. That's really been a hard thing for me to internalize. Yeah. So when we talk about virtue, then I think this is something I've just been struggling with. Like, so how do you continue to want to do the right like how do you not just go fuck it i'm a nihilist (laughs) right or like you know like how do you how do you not give up on people when people are giving you every reason to give they're they're not only saying like yeah uh you can give up on me if you want they're like no 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 i'm irredeemable let me show you how irredeemable i am to me i think that's the pressing problem of our time it's like Ha- all these ideas of like love thy neighbor or or serve the common good or or like how do you keep how do you hold on to those things when you have unlimited access to as you said the documentary of how awful everyone is or how many how awful a lot of people are yeah it's not easy and and that's part of the impetus of writing this book for me at least um there's a quote from bernard williams who's a british philosopher that i quite like where he points out that we are specially responsible for what we do rather than what other people do. It's, it was an attack on utilitarianism where he said like that, that basically a lot of the, a lot of the attacks on utilitarianism, it basically that it, that it doesn't differentiate, it doesn't take seriously, as John Rawls said, the difference among people. It, it sort of coagulates all people into the, just like little cogs in a machine who are creating good or bad. And you want to, 
activate more cogs that create good than more than the ones that create bad. And Bernard Williams says, look, we are specially responsible. We are uniquely responsible for what we do and, and, and more so than what other people do. And that really is a very simple way of saying like, okay, there are all these other people and you're looking around and they're doing various shitty things and it's really disheartening. But the answer can't be, I guess I should do those shitty things. Like it just, that can't be the right answer. Like you have to remember that you are more responsible for what you do than for what other people do. And as long as you keep that in mind, you, I, I hope you can't get to a point where even as tempting as it is to just to do whatever everybody else is doing that sucks and is giving them some some potentially so, like a head start in the race or is helping them in some way financially or socially or whatever, that it just can't be the answer to say, I know that thing is bad that that person is doing, but I'm going to also do it in order to attain whatever that person is attaining. And I, And part of that, by the way, I think is also keeping in mind, and this is obviously a stoic idea, is that and as well as that this is an Eastern idea, there's a lot of philosophy that talks about how if you are, um, it's very Buddhist, right? If you are attached to things, if you are, if you have the wrong kinds of attachments or you care too much about attaining certain things, you're on the wrong path, right? So if if you're saying, if I'm looking at someone in a position of power who is um, using his or her political influence to steer money towards a company that he or she owns stock in to gain financial wealth. And I say, well, I guess I'm going to do the same thing because if they don't care, why should I care? The, the root of that is the idea that the thing that they're gaining matters, right? That it's like, oh, that extra $23,000 in stock appreciation is something that I should care about. And so if you don't- And if it's you worth can, what you're giving up to get yes, it. Yes, that the price of your soul is is that extra money. And so if you if you start from a position where I'm going to make sure that I am attached to the right things, to the to caring about that I'm mindful, that I'm focused on what actually does matter, you will start to see that the things that they're the parts of their souls they're selling aren't worth it to, because their the thing they're trying to attain is not something you should even care about attaining. And that's hard. Like, it's hard to say that to people. It's hard to say to people, money doesn't matter or a bigger house or a nicer car doesn't matter. Like, it's hard to to believe in that sometimes. But that's a that's the deal. You got to You got to start from that position, I think, and then and then go from there. So changing gears slightly, it- can philosophy be fun or, or funny? Like uh, they seem like they would be very different. I'm just curious your take. Um, can philosophy as a discipline be fun? Is that the question? I, I think I just the idea of comedy and philosophy, one might think they're complete opposite ends of the spectrum. Certainly people who are not interested in philosophy probably have that view. Yeah. I mean, I find it very funny personally, and that could be just because I was a comedy writer first. And so I, I tend to like try to find whatever's funny about anything I'm doing. I think the trolley problem itself is deeply hilarious. There's nothing on paper funny about it. It was written in 1967 as a investigation of the doctrine of double effect, which goes back to St. Thomas Aquinas and, and the paper that Philip Afoot wrote about was specifically about the problem of abortion not funny topics, right? But the situation she puts you in is objectively hilarious. To me, at least, it's like the, everything about it is funny and everything about it leads to a funny conclusion. And when you actually picture yourself on a barreling train with no brakes and having a lever and making the life or death decisions, I find it to be, and that's why we did a whole episode of The Good Place about it, I find it to be a funny situation. A lot of the thought experiments that philosophers have come up with to talk about philosophy, I think are very funny. The discipline itself, is it funny? I don't think it is. Like it's, it's not intended to be at least. And what's funny about it is often in the margins or in the, if you take a step back and you imagine the, the people really living their lives, uh, living the lives that they have laid out as how one ought to live one's life it often becomes funny or reaches, you can reach some very funny conclusions about what it means to be a pure Kantian or utilitarian. Um, but I, you know, the, the good place was my attempt to say like, let's take this 
fairly unfunny, dry thing and try to explain it through humor, which I think means it's going to be a lot easier for people to engage with it. It does feel like, like almost from an improv standpoint, like on the the trolley problem, there's a, an element of like, well, how can I just keep escalating the stakes to make it funnier? Like the, and then you throw a fat guy off the bridge in front, you know, on top. And it's just like, how could it get more ridiculous as a premise? Yeah, there's, there's certainly, I mean, the trolley problem is, like I say in the book, it's it's been the most talked about problem in philosophy for 50 years, and most academic philosophers are sick of it, and they, they are so bored. I compare it in the book to Stairway to Heaven. It's basically the Stairway to Heaven of philosophy because it's like, yes, I recognize that it's a piece of genius, but also, God, we I don't want to hear it hear, again. We have to hear this again, <laughs> like right? So, but but what's good about something like the trolley problem is that there has been a continual conversation about it for 50 years. People have been responding to it. There's whole books on it you can read. There have been TV shows like mine and others that have engaged with it. That it's a it's a it's like a a very fast growing mold that it, that has a lot of dimension and a lot of different aspects to it that now can be analyzed and discussed. And some of them are woof some of them are really hard to understand it's, it's now where you get into at the far end of the spectrum you get into like you get into ma a lot of math there's a lot of math that <laughs> comes into philosophy that is just beyond my capacity for understanding but what i what i preferred on in the show and in the book to focus on was just the nuts and bolts like what is like what is what is this getting at like what is what is this problem trying to get at and in terms of how we can just practically speaking, make decisions that make us a little bit better than we were yesterday. Yeah, I was going to, uh, I don't know if you know the story of Chrysippus, the Stoic philosopher and how he died. No, I, don't, I know Seneca. I know how Seneca died. I don't know how Chrysippus died. Uh, Se Seneca's death is, is pretty epic. And there's almost a comedy to it. Like he keeps trying to kill himself and none of, none of it's working for Seneca. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, and then uh, he's like trying to bully his wife into doing it. And they're like, what are you doing? Uh, but, but no, the, Chrysippus is, uh, he's like one of the most serious, one of the most academics or one of the most like, uh, like ardent defenders of stoicism. So you wouldn't expect he'd go out this way, but he's an old man and he's sitting on his porch and a donkey walks up and starts eating the figs out of his garden. Uh, and he starts laughing. And then he supposedly says something like, does, does he need some wine to wash down those figs? <laughs> And then laughing so hard at his own joke for an extended period of time, he drops over dead. <laughs> That's a great death. Good work. I think so too. Uh, I mean, I, I think Socrates' death is extremely funny when you read the account of it because it's unintentionally so. But when you read the account of it, it's like, you know, he's on trial in Athens basically for just being annoying. They basically put him on trial because he was annoying. And they're in, they, they, they say, you know, here's the crime you're uh, accused of or whatever. And he gives this long and beautiful and eloquent speech about why he refuses exile and, and, uh, and why he doesn't think he should be killed. And it goes on for page after page after page. And then in the text, it's like, you know, they vote and he's going to be killed. And he's like, okay, but before you kill me, just consider this long, eloquent speech, blah, 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 blah. Here's why I did this and this and then blah, 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 blah. They take another vote. He's going to be killed. And he's like, but hold on for a second. And he, <laughs> he just keeps like making these long, beautiful, famous speeches about why he believes that he's innocent. And then it's just like. He, and doesn't he, he propose that he be rewarded instead of punished? <laughs> like, yes, he, and he does. It's a very ballsy move. He's like, what about this? What if you give me a plaque, basically? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the, I mean, uh, there, there are certainly, um, look, all philosophers are human beings and human beings are hilarious. Like by their nature, we are flawed, ridiculous, absurd creatures whose lives are wildly varied, have massive ups and downs and unexpected twists and turns who do ridiculous things that are indefensible by any ethical theory and also are capable of unbelievable generosity and kindness. And all of those things are true about all people. And so as a result, there. I mean, Seneca was a money lender in yeah. in England. He was he uh, I, he was like a wealthy man who uh, who had who was like a multi multi millionaire by by the day's standards. And when he died, didn't he say something like, "I leave I leave to you"? He was trying to work out his will, and yeah. he was like, and "I couldn't get it done in time" because they were like, "You got to go, man." And eventually, he was like, he said to his wife something like, "I I leave to you something greater than money, which is." 
the the image of like a noble and, and perfect yeah. life. And meanwhile, he's been screwing people out of money in England for decades. Like, and he has the gall like 30 seconds before he dies to go like, just be like me. I mean, that's were, amazing. Oh, like, yeah, but what should we do with the money? Like, but the money, what should we do with the money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a legal question here, buddy. So I, what is what I think is beautiful and frustrating and wonderful and annoying about people in general is that we are all, we all contain these multitudes. We are all capable of, of the greatest achievements and the kindest gestures and also the most callous and selfish and awful decisions. They're all inside all of us. And so the theories that I love are the ones that basically say like, yeah, we all suck, man. We're all imperfect. We're all monsters. We're all also potentially great. Let's just try to like minimize the bad stuff and emphasize the good stuff. And that is one way or the other. That's what they were all getting at. Like that's what the utilitarians wanted. It's what it's what Kant wanted to nail exactly. It's what the virtue ethicists wanted. It's what Tim Scanlon, who wrote uh, "What Do We Owe to What We Owe to Each Other," it's what they're all after. Derek Parfit, the the contemporary philosopher, described all of the schools of philosophy as scaling the same mountain from different faces of the of the peak. Right? It's like utilitarians are coming up on the east face, and the Kantians are coming up on the north face, and the. Every, and that's, I love that image because it really is the more you read from different eras and of different people, the more you realize they're all after the same thing. It's just like, what do we do? What the hell do we do? Where this is so hard. Life is so hard and complicated. What do we do? How do we try to get better at this? You know? Yeah, no, I think like obviously Gladiator is a drama, but there is a humor to it where it's like you have the, the only philosopher king ever in history. And he just raises the shittiest kid. Like he's just like, <laughs> like so bad, like the worst kid of all time. There's something just hilarious and also fitting and like human about that. Yeah. And uh, I love it. Yeah. I mean, it's what like succession is about too, right? At some level, it's like this guy's a monster and he raised three monstrous, four monstrous children. And there's like a battle for their soul going on in every episode of like, do they they're slavishly devoted to him. Is any of them going to break free? Like, and every time they start to, he like draws them back and like, and it's what the Sopranos was about, right? The Sopranos is about the, a, a, or the a Trumps in real life. Yes. It's like these, like the, the depictions, it's what breaking bad was about, right? It's like this good guy who has a monster inside him. And it, the whole show is a battle for his soul. Does he, does it, does he win or does he lose? Uh, and it's in the Sopranos, it's through therapy. It's like, I'm, I have I, there's a potential that he can f see the light here, but he's also so steeped in this awful behavior. It's unclear whether he's ever going to break free. Like once you start thinking about the f once once philosophy gets into your into your brain and into your soul, you start seeing it everywhere. You start seeing the depictions of characters and movies and TV shows and people around you. You see everything as a collection of philosophical decisions. So, uh, and I'm sure you have to run. So my last question for you would be like, speaking of the stuff we're talking about in the world, and then uh, obviously the, the TV shows we're talking about, I have found that like lately, like all I can really watch are like reruns of The Office or, you know, like <laughs> Parks and Rec or like, I can like, it's, I, I can watch like Law and Order because Law and Order is like so self-contained. Mm -hmm. But like, I just found like, I can't do these like, 40 hour Netflix dramas or even like great stuff, like anything like basically post Breaking Bad. I'm I, like, I just don't, I, I feel like I don't have the emotional or the cognitive uh, ability to just like put up with more, like another <laughs> awful world. So I just return to like the same shows over and over again. What is that? Well, I, it's probably a couple things. Um, the pandemic, I think was a, uh, was like the, the, global equivalent of like a, a cold rainy day where a lot of people's impulse was like, I have to be in my house. I can't leave my house because it's cold and rainy and I want to eat a big bowl of mac and cheese and watch friends. That's what yeah. I want to do on a cold rainy day. Like I, I think that the, the fear and the, and the unknowability of the world, I think caused a lot of people to go back and just revisit things that bring them comfort and joy, which I think is completely understandable and, and frankly, probably healthy. Um, I think there's also the global political situation, the the existential threats that we face from things like global warming and 
and Russia massing forces on the Ukrainian border and all of the depressing stuff that you read every day and the, and the gerrymandering of the U.S. congressional districts and the impending doom of the midterms and all that sort of stuff. I think all of those things have led us, at, at least I'll speak personally, they've led me to try to draw a line between the engagement that I have in the world, which I think is a civic duty that we all share, and my personal private life. And in my personal and private life, what I want to do is sit on the couch with my wife and watch something that's entertaining. And I I have found the same difficulty with grappling with dark, sad, downbeat depictions of human beings um, because I think I'm trying to get away from the reality of the dark and and brutal depiction of human beings that we see in the real world every day. So I, it's some combination of those factors. It's also probably just, I don't know how old you are. I'm 46. You get to a certain point in your life and you think you start doing triage in your mind. Like how many, how many days, months, weeks, years do I have left? How do I want to spend them? And I mostly want to spend them being happy if I can possibly. <laughs> yes. like, and, and that doesn't mean, by the way, that there isn't happiness and joy to be found in a brilliant depiction of Tony Soprano or Walter White. Like, of course there is. Like, that's a specific kind of joy. And I hope that I never get so afraid of, of dealing with like human psychology on through entertainment that I don't, that someone says like, this show is incredible and I run away from it because I don't want to engage with that kind of depiction. But I also think that the more the older you get, the the greater your impulse is to just try to share in a joyful experience with other people, um, and and to have that be the thing that you, you that you pass your time with. You know, I think that's why Ted Lasso's worked for sure. Sure, yeah, I think that's a perfect example. Like that Ted Lasso coming along at that moment in the pandemic, like it's exactly what everyone wanted. They just wanted radiating positivity and joy and it and it really uh, hit a nerve did you did you see that question it was this was on twitter a couple months uh, this is i guess in 2020 but it was like what beloved television character would have voted for trump and so you had to like <laughs> you had to ruin them I, what what beloved character in your universe do you think would be like one of the anti-vaxxers anti-maxxers that were maskers that we're talking about F from a show i have actually worked on you're yeah. saying yeah uh, boy. Um, cause like I was going to say, well, you know, Archie Bunker obviously would have voted for sure, Trump, but of I, course, uh, I'm not that old. I didn't work on all the family. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, well, Jeremy Jam was a, a, oh, yes. a character on, on Parks and Recreation played by John Glazer, who was a city councilman who was also a dentist and he had moved to the town of Pawnee, Indiana because he was a dentist in Pawnee. Uh, Pawnee's biggest industry was a candy factory and they didn't fl put fluoride in their water. Yes. So he was like jackpot, right? And so his his sole intention was to profit from his position as a city council person. There's no question. He would have been campaigning for Trump. I mean, he yes. would have been, he would have yard signs and, and floating a boat around a lake. Um, he's the first one that comes to mind. I don't know that That's any of the good- one. Yeah, I don't know if any of the good place characters would have, I mean- even some, sometimes you get into the situation where you're like, when you, with a question like that, where you say like, well, what about Eleanor, Kristen Bell's character, which she voted for Trump? And my answer usually is sort of like, well, she probably didn't vote. Like she doesn't right. care. Like sure. she doesn't care one way or the other. Like she probably thought Trump was funny, but she was also like, he's gross. I don't want to, like she would just wouldn't vote in the election, you know? So I don't know. There's, I'm sure there were more, but Jeremy Jam is the, is basically is, he's Donald Trump Jr. essentially in the, in the show before Donald Trump Jr. was a thing. No, that's a great one. Yeah. And he'd, he'd have a, a no mask policy at the dentist's office for sure. Oh, 100%. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he wouldn't even wear a mask. And then he would, he would, there's no question that Jeremy Jam was infected with COVID early on and also <laughs> passed it on to like 700 other people. <laughs> No, and I, I got to imagine what, uh, Dwight's probably going down uh, a pretty dark internet rabbit hole, and then uh, Ron Swanson. That that's the big danger there. Well, Ron, Ron, uh, a couple of people asked me what the, who I thought Ron would vote for, and Ron is a libertarian, um, but he's an actual libertarian. Like he he's a nineteenth century libertarian. He lives on his own farm, and he he hunts his own meat. He he's not a fake contemporary American political libertarian. And I think that the things that he admired above all other characteristics were things like integrity 
and honesty. And I can't imagine he would have voted for Trump. He wouldn't have voted for Biden, certainly, but he wouldn't have voted. He would have written in like Teddy Roosevelt or something, you know, like he wouldn't, but he wouldn't have voted for Trump. And D- Dwight's possible because Dwight was very clannish and he was very um, impressed by wealth and status. And I think that there, it's possible that that Trump's whole deal would have sort of appealed to him. Um, and you're you're pro- you're definitely right. He was also something of a conspiracy theorist. So there's he's there taken is a- horse dewormer for sure. Yeah, but he was taking it also 10 years ago, before, <laughs> yeah. long before. I, he was rubbing it on his gums for some completely unrelated reason. So he thinks he's inoculated against it because he's been eating ivermectin for <laughs> since he was a child, you know. Um, but so, yeah, there's there's definitely a dark potential path for Dwight Schrute through contemporary America. Uh, I hope, as someone who has affection for him as a character, I hope he didn't go down that path. That would be depressing if he were a, like a Q, QAnon guy or something. Well, no, I think to connect to where we are in the world and the issue, the moral philosophy you're talking about in the book, that's really been the hardest part is you watch people who you know deep down have good hearts, who you are fond of, who would, like, I I live in rural Texas. These are people who would, uh, you know, rebuild my house if it burned down or change my tire or, or, you know, come pull my truck out when it gets stuck. But then... You know, even of the Ron Swansons of the world, you you can watch how easily a person can become susceptible to misinformation, can be mm-hmm. radicalized, can be can be deceived. Almost, it's almost using the identity. Like we see this with with mass and vaccines, where it's like they had this idea of courage, so it, resistance feels like courage. But if you're resisting the wrong thing, you're missing the point. And you can watch how good people can end up doing profoundly immoral things and still maintain their identity as a moral person. Yes, there is a there is a default setting amongst a significant part of America. And the default setting is no. Like if when when asked to engage in something or to be a part of something or to make a sacrifice, the default is no. And it and it takes a lot to get those people to say yes. And that is a that's deeply baked in the history of the country, into the settling of the country, into the frontier celebration of the country, into the cowboy imagery that we all uh, that everybody grew up on. The default setting is take care of yourself, defend your land, sit on the sit on a, uh, your porch with a shotgun and make sure nobody takes your stuff. Right. And that and I, I spend a lot of time in Texas. My grandparents lived in Texas my whole life. And the, it is a, it is truly wild because you the Texans, in my experience, are the friendliest people I have ever met. I have never once had a bad interaction with a Texan, really, in any in a grocery store, in a, in a on a. My grandfather used to play golf at his uh, re- retirement uh, country club, and the, everybody was kind and generous, and they would remember your name, and they would pat you on the head, and guys used to slip me a quarter and say, "Go, you know, go get yourself a gumball." and and uh, and it, it is one of my favorite places in the world to visit is Texas. I love Texas. I if if the subject of politics came up, I would never be invited back. And so there it is. It's hard. It's a it's a real um, it's just a lot of cognitive dissonance between the kindness and the essential goodness. What I see is the essential goodness of people, not just in Texas, but all over the country. And like you said, the generosity, like you're. You're, you're, there's a flood or there's an earthquake or there's something, there's a, any kind of problem. Communities rally around and they help each other out. And this is no different. Like wearing a mask is no different than helping someone bail out water out of their basement. It's the same exact thing, but it has been politicized to the point where it, where it is received as different. It, and that's a real bummer because it's not different. Bailing water out of your, out of your neighbor's basement after a flood is no different in its essential instinct from wearing a mask. And yet people think of them as different. Very well said. Well, Michael, I, I absolutely love the book. It's great. Uh, this will go up uh, when it's out. And uh, I really appreciate you writing it. And uh, I hope the sequel has more stoicism in it. <laughs> yes, I know. When I was, uh, was coming on here, I was like, oh, shit, I should have written more about the Stoics. And that would have... <laughs> we, we, got one, we got one footnote. I, you did. You did about Kant. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> well, thank you for having me on. This was really fun. I really enjoyed the I really love your podcast and, uh, and I really uh, enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for having me. 